Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidil enbiya'i ve mursalin. Seyyidina ve mevlana ve habibina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. Today's uh, class is going to be picking up from where we left off last time when we were considering the uh, fundamental issue of tawbah, that is to say the return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the penitent fire in the heart that purifies us and restores us to the ahsani taqwim, the best of all forms, which is the, the fitra, the, the, the basic uh, human modality in which Allah has created us and which he wants us to maintain. The next book that follows on from that in the very subtle sequencing of topics in Imam al-Ghazali's Ihya ul-Lum al-Din is the Kitab al-Sabri wa shukr the book of patience and gratitude. And the Imam puts these two things together. And we'll see very soon exactly why that should be. So, uh, he begins with these words, Amma ba'd fa'inna al-imana nisfan nisfu sabr Iman, faith, has two halves. One half is sabr, patience, and the other half is shukr, thankfulness. As has been handed down in tradition and in the hadith. So he's immediately startling us with the reality of the deep importance of this, which is that it's really the same thing as Iman. Sabr and Shukr, if you have them, you put them together, really that's 100% of what Iman constitutes. Similarly, Iman, that is to say, the fixed, secure awareness of the reality of Allah in your heart, necessarily gender, engenders these qualities. Because you have the Sabr, which enables you to be patient in adversity, and also to uh, make the right choices when ethical difficulties come uh, your way. But you also have this consciousness that everything in the world actually has a meaning. And that that meaning is what gives a kind of extra dimension to the human experience. That no longer are we looking at the world as though it was two dimensions projected on a screen. But this extra dimension of meaning, which is the meaning of faith, is something that actually enables us to see things in their form magnificent and also in perspective. So this is the way he wants to lead us into this topic. He's talking about faith as being the same thing as, really as definable by sabr and shukr. And then he says something that's perhaps even more extraordinary. وَهُمَا أَيْضًا وَصْفَانِ مِنْ أَوْصَافِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَإِسْمَانِ مِنْ أَسْمَائِهِ الْحُسْنَى And they are also two of the qualities of Allah two of the adjectives that we use to describe him, and two of his uh, most beautiful names. So how could that be? إِذْ سَمَّا نَفْسَهُ صَبُورًا وَشَكُورًا Since he has called himself patient and thankful. فَالْجَهْلُ بِحَقِيقَةِ الصَّبْرِ وَالشُّكْرِ جَهْلٌ بِكِلَى شَطْرَيْ الْإِيمَانِ so ignorance of the true nature of what sabr and shukr is, is actually an ignorance of both sides of faith itself. So he's really grabbing us by the lapels and shaking us and insisting on the real importance of, of this topic. And it's important to, to bear in mind the subtle relationship that is being invoked here between the way in which human beings can adorn themselves with beautiful qualities and the way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is characterized by certain perfect qualities. How do we know what is perfection and what is imperfection? What is perfect is ultimately not what a consensus of human beings in any particular decade regard as perfect. What is perfect is that which has its origin and its true form in the nature of the divine, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't say that mercy is good because Parliament has decided that mercy is good, or because a filmmaker has told us that mercy is good, or because a poet or some rhetorician has t told us that mercy is good. Mercy is good because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Kataba ala nafsihir rahma. He has prescribed mercy upon himself. And because he has called himself Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, the compassionate, the merciful. 
so that there is a relationship between the virtues that exist on earth, particularly these monjiet, these saving virtues that are the subject of this section of Imam al-Ghazali's Ihya, and of which the sabr and shukr form such, such powerful foundations. There is a relationship between these virtues which human beings can acquire and make themselves beautiful with, and some of the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we obviously are finite beings. We come and we go in a few years, um, we've rotted away and nobody remembers us and there's a new generation that has the same illusions and the same dreams and the same hopes and the same fears and that's the nature of the human condition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-khalaq al-baqi. He is the one who creates, he is the one who goes on. He is the one who does not change. He is the one who knows everything that has happened, that is happening, that will happen. So there's no real analogy, no actual qiyas that you can engage in between the nature of the divine in his perfection and his omnipotence, in his omniscience and his everything and our nature as eminently fallible and ignorant human beings. But nonetheless there is an extraordinary way in which names can be shared and that is because we as human beings try to adorn ourselves with beautiful qualities and there is no source of beauty or goodness or appropriateness uh, except in, in the divine. And this is the meaning of the prophetic word, which is an amazing hadith and is a commandment. Adorn yourself with the qualities of Allah. Allah is merciful, you should be merciful. Allah is patient, you should be patient. Allah is just, you should be just. And so on. And Imam al-Ghazali actually has another book, Al-Maqsad al-Asna, The Highest Aim, in which he takes us through each one of the 99 names uh, that have been attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the hadith and explains how our relationship to that particular divine perfection ought to be. And the perfect human being, the one who has truly become what a human being is asked to become, is somebody who has the due proportion of all of these things. That's what it is to be a perfect human being. It's eminently ethical. So, in short, the Imam has chosen to start this book with a reminder that when we try and acquire these qualities of being patient, of being grateful, we are acquiring qualities that are not just conventions of this world, but that link us to something that is infinite and something that is, is transcendent. So, Imam al-Ghazali has chosen to put these two things together, sabr and shukr. And he's also said that this is fundamental to what it means to be a believer. And we find in the Qur'an, really more than any other world scripture, an emphasis on these principles. Sabr, sabr, sabr. Wherever you open it, if you come to the text for the first time, you open it, there's a lot about sabr in the Qur'an. And of course you can see the qualities of sabr in the Holy Prophet wasallam in the seerah, from the earliest days of the persecution uh, in Mecca until the extraordinary consummation of his story at the end of the Medinan period and the sabr that was shown by his sahaba radiallahu anhum and the sabr really that's shown by everybody who's worth anything who is engaged in the struggle against the enemies of truth in this world and the enemies of balance in his own self it's all about sabr ulaika yu'tawna ajrahum marrataini bima sabaru they shall be given their reward twice because of the sabr that they had. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Allah is with those who show patience. This ma'ayya, this withness, this extraordinary quality of proximity to the divine, which means conformity to what he wants us to be. Walking in the place where he wants us to walk. Looking at what he wants us to look at. Saying what he wants us to say. Muwafaqa, corresponding, conforming to the ideal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established as something for us to strive after. That is what the ma'iyah actually means. And this sabr is the way to get that. And it works for communities as well. And we made them imams, guiding by our command when they had sabr. And that's the way of peoples and of nations. No people gets to become great and powerful and glorious, whether it be for reasons of dunya or reasons of truth, without having the capacity to restrain itself, to work hard, 
to overcome the immediate temptation to fritter away one's uh, abilities and skills and potential in immediate pleasures and immediate distractions. No one has to postpone one's desires, abolish one's desires even, and then, through this quality of sabr, one is made an imam, uh, a leader in this, in this world. And, in fact, the whole basis of religious transformation, this process of tawbah that we spoke about last time, is about sabr. Without sabr, that is to say, being patient in the face of temptations and adversity, you can't really engage in this process of overcoming the bad stuff that you do. فَإِنَّ فِي الصَّبْرِ عَلَى مَا تَكْرَهُ خَيْرٌ كَثِيرٌ It's a hadith in, in Tirmidhi. There is, in being patient in the face of things that you dislike, much good. So if it's difficult to get up in the morning, if it's difficult to avoid certain foods in which there is haram or something shubha, if it's difficult to avoid bad company, if it's difficult to observe one's religious obligations, and one's ethical qualities, if it's difficult to visit relatives um, who perhaps are difficult back to one, if it's difficult to pay attention to the religious education of your children, and so forth, all of these things that are difficult, being sabir, controlling yourself, disciplining yourself in that situation, fihi khayrun kathir, there is great good in that. Each time you succumb to a temptation, each time you say, I'll do that thing just once, I deserve it. I need a break. Then the next time you have the choice between doing that thing that wastes your time or doing something that's going to take you forward and benefit you or benefit somebody else, it's going to be easier for you to choose the, the lazy thing. Don't think that I will postpone that good action or that toba until such time as it's actually easier because you have no means of being sure that it's going to be easier for you tomorrow and in fact the chances are it's going to be harder. The more you postpone that action, the more difficult it's going to be for you. So do it now. And have sabr, and inshallah, you either will end up not being interested in those things at all, or they will be given to you in a halal and rewarding way at some later point. Look at what Imam Ali, karramallahu wajahu, says, As-sabru min al-iman bi manzilati ra'si min al-jasad. Patience with regard to faith is in the same situation as the head with regard to the body. And what does that mean? Well, the head is where we have our capacity for tamyiz, for discerning things, for knowing what is a positive thing to do, what's a negative thing to do. Uh, without it, we are just uh, senses and experiences. We are essentially, as human beings, just robotic. Similarly, if you don't have this capacity for self-restraint, if you don't have this capacity to deal in a dignified way with misfortunes and hardship, then in effect your humanity has been lost. What is it that defines us as human beings? Not the senses, not the body, not our physical capacities, not even our mental capacities. What defines our humanity, what makes us Bani Adam, is the capacity to regulate everything else. So that the mind, the consciousness, is like a king in the kingdom, which is the body. And if the king isn't there, and the king isn't disciplining the body, the body will fall to pieces just as the kingdom will fall to pieces without a government and without a just, just king. Now, here the imam reminds us of something that is said in the Kitab at tawbah which is a kind of threefold plan of action. Remember when we were talking about repentance, that he says, first of all, it's knowing that something was wrong. And then it's having that fire in your heart that tells you that you've done something wrong. And then the amal, the third thing, which is doing something to put it right. Similarly, with sabr, there is the knowledge that a certain decision has to be taken and that a certain sacrifice is being asked of one. And then there is the state whereby we actually, which is where we become truly human, say, I will choose X and I will not choose Y, which is what makes us above the cats and the dogs and the pigs and everything else and makes us extraordinary. That's the capacity to choose. And the inward hal that both promotes that, that comes from faith, that gives us the strength to choose the right thing, and also the consequence, the spiritual benefit that flows from having made the right decision. And then the action itself. And the imam compares this to a tree. 
he says, a tree has roots, it has branches, and it has fruit. And the roots are like the knowledge. And the branches are like the state and the actual action or the refusal to act that constitutes the essence of sabr itself. And the fruits, the spiritual benefits that, that uh, ensue from that. And the purpose of the true re tree really is for the fruit. Nobody plants an apple tree uh, for any reason other than to get the apples, most people. Similarly, nobody plants wheat for any reason other than to get uh, the, the, the flour to make grain. Similarly, the purpose of all religious actions and sacrifices is to produce the fruit. And the fruit are always these inward dispositions that benefit ourselves and that benefit society. Now, this is something that we learn and that a good teacher can teach us, but that is something that is part of our growing into humanity. If we're going to make this large claim that actually self-restraint and conscientious disciplining of our khawatir, of our inward chatterings that make us want to do this, or want to do that, is actually what constitutes our status as Benny Adam, as real human beings, rather than just one more part of the material world, then we need to look at, at the way in which human beings grow up. A baby has no sober. A baby is hungry, uh, or is cold, and immediately it cries and has to be immediately satisfied. And then it grows up a little bit, and then it starts at the age of 12, 13, 14, to have this tamiz and this ability genuinely to get a grip on itself and genuinely to make sacrifices. And the older one gets, and this is something that's part of the fitra and is a good thing, but it's irrespective, really, of religious commitment, although religion really helps to give it meaning, that is something that enables us to grow from just being a, a puking mass of childlike humanity into something that can be a citizen and something that can be a responsible son and parent and uh, warrior or physician or whatever it might be. That's the process whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us into Bani Adam. And it's an, an extraordinary, extraordinary process. But it requires this essential thing that is perhaps the greatest gift of religion. If religion is about remembering, about being really conscious, because we know that our actions are not just about citizenship, but are about the akhirah, then we're really going to be very careful about intentions. We're really going to be very careful about ensuring that we know why we're doing things. The tragedy of the modern world is that very often we go through whole years in a kind of coma, not really thinking. And our desires and choices are made for us, firstly by an endless proliferation of laws, more and more laws, more and more restrictions, more and more impositions. And secondly, by the fact that the temptations and the shahawat and the distractions are imposed on us wherever we go. As soon as you go out of your house, there is some advertising phenomenon, there is some song, there is somebody who's listening to a commercial on the radio. There is somebody who's wearing a T-shirt that's advertising something. Everything is uh, an advertising uh, gauntlet that we run constantly. And that, from the spiritual point of view, is disruptive. Because as we saw, what we want is to be tatma'inu qulub, our hearts to be at peace. But the modern world isn't interested in people being peaceful at all. Because people who are really calm and content with what they've got don't make good consumers. So the whole system of modernity really is about provoking desires, reminding us of the desires that we've had but perhaps have temporarily forgotten, or actually creating desires for things that we never really knew we wanted. So somebody invents the iPod, and the next day, tens of millions of people are kind of sad because they haven't got an iPod, and another desire has been created. And the whole process of modernity becomes the creation of desire by corporate megastructures and the attempts by human beings to satisfy desire and to get some kind of pleasure out of the product for a while before something else comes along. And the fashion industry is very similar to that. That the clothes that we have are perfectly adequate. But in fact, because somebody wants to make money, they invent a certain sense of dissatisfaction 
amongst human beings, particularly amongst young people. And so they throw away the clothes that they've got and they buy something else that's marginally different. And it's not even a movement towards perfection, it's just change of fashion. As uh, somebody once said, fashion is so ugly that it has to be changed every six months. It's not even about beauty or dignity any longer, it's just about somebody other than yourself making money out of your desire to look like everybody else. That's all it is. And whole lives are spent just running around trying to do the correct thing. Am I drinking the right thing? Am I eating in the right restaurants? Am I subscribing to the right magazines? How do I look? How do, am I, have I got the right kind of job for somebody who's in my age group? Everything is about anxiety. Now, when you take the huge step, the biggest step there could ever be, which is to step into the game of religion and deen, and you listen to these voices, you learn to be free from all of that. All of these chains that the modern world is placing around you, forcing you to conform to a single global monoculture, those chains are broken. Without you having to become something weird, some people might regard you as weird, but actually to become something free and more dignified. And that's why we speak of serbeslik or horriyat in religion, freedom. Not freedom in a consumer world to choose an ever proliferating range of fabricated desires and products, but freedom from those things. Freedom not to be a monk in a hole in a mountain, but to be a fulfilled human being who is at peace with himself and his world. And that's one of the most radical things that traditional religion offers to us in, in, in this age. Really something quite extraordinary. So let's move on and see what the Imam has to say, has to say next. He has a chapter which he calls Bayanu Dawa is Sabri wa ma yusta'anu bihi alayhi, which is about what medicines can we find in order to help us with this sabr. How do we achieve that freedom? How do we break those chains? So the Imam here says, I'alam anna alladhi anzala al-da' anzala al-dawa' Know that the one who has created the sickness has also created the cure. And this we use in the context of Tib Nabawi, prophetic medicine. That for every sickness, Allah has created a cure. But he's saying for sicknesses at the heart, that is also the case. So what's going to be uh, the, the cure here? فَالصَّبْرُ وَإِنْ كَانَ شَاقًا أَوْ مُمْتَنِعًا فَتَحْسِيلُهُ مُمْكِنْ بِمَعْجُونِ الْعِلْمِ وَالْعَمَلِ even if it seems really difficult or impossible, it is possible to get hold of this medicine and it is through a composite that has been mixed together of two ingredients which are knowledge and action. Knowledge and action are the ingredients from which the medicines which treat these heart diseases are compounded. And this, of course, is all about the nafs, the ego. The greatest of your enemies, which is nafsuka alati bayna jambay. Your soul, your ego, which is between your two sides. Anything else in the world is slight compared to the damage that that can do to you. Look at the people in the world who have got themselves into the worst, most terrible situations of humiliation. Why are they like that? It's because of the nafs, the ego. And nafs al amara is The ego that commands evil. That's within all of us. On the face of it, the religious life should be easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has manifested himself in a blazingly obvious way through all of these signs that we see through his miraculous creation. He has given us a light load. We only have to pray five times a day. We have to fast one month in the year. We have to make hajj once in a lifetime. And the life of the Muslim is relaxed and easy and beautiful and comfortable. It should be easy, but we mess up again and again. Why? Because there's this thing within us that wants to pull us away from uh, what makes us truly alive. Because Allah yad'ukum lima yuqikum. Allah and his messenger are calling us to what gives us life, to what makes us really alive. 
And the death, the spiritual death, the thing that makes us like a robot, just follow the latest stimulus of the senses, the thing that really switches off our humanity and makes us a kind of blank screen for a while, that comes from the nafs, from the ego. How do we deal with it? Well, we mentioned in the context of sabr that it means uh, constant effort and that every time you have a victory over the temptation, the next victory becomes easier. And that each time the temptation scores a victory over you, you are weakened and you can be defeated more easily next time. That's an inflexible rule. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, some of us, many of us, certain victories despite ourselves. He may show us something, give us something, uplift us, give us an amazing breath of his mercy that may, despite ourselves, bring about a tawbah apparently without any reason. But generally, the spiritual path is about climbing up the mountain. You have to deal with that upward mountain path. And it's not going to be easy. But you know that each time you decide that the next step is too steep, so you're going to walk sideways or go down a little bit, that the path isn't going to get any shorter by doing that. And that's the only path that is before you. So what you have to do is to remember to watch yourself. Sabr is all about full self-awareness. In other words, it's about being fully human. So let's move on now and look at the second of the two uh, great sections of this book. We've looked at sabr. Let's now take a look at the matter of, of shukr. الشطر الثاني من الكتاب في الشكر وله ثلاثة أركان. The second half of the book, which is about shukr, thankfulness, and it has three pillars, three main sections. الأول في فضيلة الشكر وحقيقته. The first is about the great merit, the virtue of shukr, and what it's really about. والثاني في حقيقة النعمة وأقسامها. And the second is about what a blessing really is and the categories of blessings. الثالث في بيان الأفضل من الشكر والصبر And the third, is, the third is an explanation of which is better, patience or thankfulness. There's obviously going to be uh, a tension in some situations. So, the first of these. اعلم أن الله تعالى قرن الشكر بالذكر في كتابه مع أنه قال ولا ذكر الله أكبر. Know that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala connects shukr with the principle of dhikr in His book, even though He said ولا ذكر الله أكبر and the remembrance of God is is greater. فقال تعالى فذكروني أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون. Remember me, I will remember you. Be grateful to me. And do not uh, be ungrateful or disbelieving. وَقَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَمَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ What will Allah do with your punishment if you have gratitude and if you are a believer? وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَسَنَجِزِ الشَّاكِرِينَ And we shall uh, reward those who are thankful. وَقَالَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِخْبَارًا عَنْ إِبْلِيسِ اللَّعِينَ And Allah says, uh, reporting the words of, of Iblis, لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I shall certainly sit for them around your straight path. In other words, to pull them aside. قِيلْ هُوَ طَرِيقُ الشُّكْرِ And it said, it is the way of thankfulness. In other words, the way in which the shaitan, the nafs, the hawa, the lower inclinations of the human self, pull us off the straight path, this way of istiqama, this shortest path between two points, is by destroying our sense of, of shukr. وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ shakirin, And you will find most of mankind to be ungrateful. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ shakur. And few of my servants are thankful. Now, he's already said that faith is this mixture, this medicinal compound 
of sabr and shukr, and that sabr is made up of knowledge and action. Shukr is gratitude which is really deep awareness. Not the awareness of the one who goes through the world and sees as if he's at a sushi bar with all the treats moving before him, different opportunities for gratifying different <coughs> pleasure centers in the brain. The one who is shakir may not be taking these things. The one who is shakir is the one who sees these things and is amazed by them. The one who is shakir is the one who sees the beauty of a mountain that he'll never visit and never climb and is grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his creative gifts. The one who is shakir is the one who sees the sheer immensity and diversity of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the most beautiful registers of divine discourse in the Qur'an is where Allah speaks of his ayat, of his signs. اِخْتِلَافُ layli wa nahar How he creates the succession of the night and the day. How he creates the male and the female. How he creates the different اِخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ the difference of your languages and your colors, how he creates different orders of creation. All of this is there for us not just to enjoy, but to spiritually do something about. And again, just as sabr is the key to being fully awake as a human being, rather than just anesthetized in some mindless pleasure culture, shukr is how you become fully part of the miracle of creation. Because the unbeliever and kafir really is the same as saying somebody who doesn't give, give thanks. We say kufran or na'mah, to deny a blessing. He is the one who goes through the world of signs and insists that they're not signs pointing to anything at all. Or that they point to each other. Or, as the parable says, he is the one who sees the water in the well and denies the possibility that the water could have come from outside the well. He sees wujud, he sees being, he sees how things are, but he has no interest, no capacity in seeing that for every ni'mah there is a mun'im. That for every blessing there is one who confers the blessing. And that's a real blindness. And this again is one of the sicknesses of modernity. People have more, but they give less thanks. And the believer, when he gives more thanks, is given more. If you give thanks, I will give you more. The tragedy of the modern world in its consumerist intoxication is that people take more and more, and they're being urged to take more and more. That's how it is, and the hadith is very clear. In kanalin insani wadin min dhahab latamanna an yakuna lahu wadiyan. This is what he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If a man had a whole valley full of gold, he would want to have two valleys full of gold. But at the end, it's only dust that will fill his mouth. And this is another of the crazy intoxications of modernity, the false promises. Earn more, get more, be more happy. Well, if you earn more, you can get more. But happiness is something that's a very subtle thing that governments can't give you, corporations can't give you, products can't give you. A good relationship amongst people who have absolutely nothing in the world is going to give them more happiness than somebody who has a billion but who always argues with his wife. Because the real things that bring us serenity in our hearts are not really measured with wealth. Now Imam al-Ghazali is going to talk about this particular interesting paradox and this mistake that all of us make again and again. The more I get, the happier I'll be this ridiculous intoxication somewhere else. And inshallah, we'll have an opportunity to look at that, where he talks about the issue of faqr, of poverty, and zuhud, doing without. And we'll see that his solution is uh, the middle way. Khairul umuri awsatuha. The best of all matters is the middle way. He's not saying, because all of these extra treats won't make you happier, but will make you unhappy, therefore you shouldn't have anything at all. No, he will show that the way of Islam is a way of balance, that we take what we need, and that beyond that is just more stress and more anxiety and more complexity. Muslim life is a comfortable life, but it's a simple life, and it's simplicity that enables us to cultivate what we really need 
which is what the hearts crave, which is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, everything is anxiety. Everything is stress. Everything is jaza, or being anxious. And what does the soul need? It needs dhikrullah ta'ala. It needs to remember its Lord. You can give the soul the new iPod. You can give the soul the new iPhone. You can give the soul the latest laptop. You can give the soul a holiday in the Bahamas. Fine, much of that may be halal, but it won't stop the soul making a noise and being anxious and wanting more and wanting more because that's not the food that it really craves. Give it the simplest thing, the thing that doesn't cost anything, the thing for which it was created, which is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then ah, it will be qalb salim, which is what you have to come up to the judgment seat with anyway. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On the last day, when neither money nor wealth will be of any use to us except he who comes to Allah with a sound heart. قَلْبْ salim, And the salim means whole. In other words, not that it's been made something other than what it is, but that it's unbroken. It's not wounded. Otherwise, we go through life with a voice inside our head saying, I have to do this, I have to get that, my neighbour's got this, my neighbour has got that. And we use our lives just running after things that just make us, the next stage in the race, running after something else. People make money out of us for that. People may point at us and say, there's somebody who's conforming perfectly. She's wearing the latest clothes, she's conforming. He's doing this, he's conforming. He's doing that, he's conforming. But if you're looking to silence the baby that's screaming in your arms, you won't find that that's the way. What we need instead is this virtue of gratitude. And gratitude means to recognize the meaning of things. That with every ni'mah there is a mun'im. That behind every blessing in creation there is one who has provided that blessing. The imam then goes on to talk about this quality of shukr. Now remember we saw with sabr, he said there's three stages. Knowledge, state, action. And he makes the same point here. If you really want to understand what it is to be, have shukr, to be shakir, to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make this part of your spiritual discipline, it's a three-point program. Knowledge, state, action. The ilm, the knowledge, is the inner sight that you see through the form of the thing, through the atoms and the neutrons and the protons, to the meaning of the thing, which is that the ni'mah comes from the mun'im. In other words, when you see that something is beautiful, you recognize Allah's beauty in that thing. When you love something, you recognize the love of Allah in something. When you see something as balanced and as appropriate, you see the balance and appropriateness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that thing. And mostly we find that in nature. You can also find it in pure human beings. You can find it in human beauty. The shahid, the one whose beauty bears witness to the perfection of the creator, is something that the poets have regularly sung about. And sometimes in a beautiful place like this, everything has been done by pure hearts, by pure craftsmen, with love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger and the silsila of their tariqah in their hearts. And as a result, the place is beautiful and it's a place where hearts can can be softened. So that's the deep view that we need, the iman that enables us to see behind the forms of things into meaning. And then the hal of shukr begins. Imam al-Ghazali defines this hal as al-farahu bil mun'im ma'a hay'ati al-khudu'i wa tawadu'. It's a good definition. It means to take joy in the source of the blessing, while having the attitude of humility and submission. And that's quite a subtle psychological insight, that really to perceive, if you go to a fruit tree and you see the branches heavy with plums or with apples or with peaches, and the heart intuits automatically that this is a gift held out by by, by a beautiful creator that wishes human beings to, to eat and to drink and to be happy. If you have that wonderful sense in your heart, then you will not suddenly jump up and shout, Allahu Akbar. You will have a certain 
humility in your heart, you will think, subhanallah, alhamdulillah. And that's the imam's psychological observation. The state that accompanies the knowledge that these things are blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the state of humility. And that's why often the agriculturalist can be of a, a high spiritual state. Or the one who looks after animals can be of a high spiritual state. Because very often if you work with the direct gifts of Allah through nature uh, frequently, you get a very deep spiritual intuitive wisdom about uh, how uh, Allah's creation works. And a certain humility comes from that, that that's very beautiful. Then the imam goes on to talk about this humble joy. And he says it has three aspects. First he says, imagine that you were given a beautiful horse by a king. Okay, you have three uh, consequent attitudes from that. Firstly, you're happy to have a horse because you're richer and it's a beautiful horse, so alhamdulillah, you have that farah, you have that joy. Secondly, you have the joy of knowing that the king loves you and wants to honour you. It's not just the horse, but it's the intention behind the gift that is uh, something that gives you happiness. And the third aspect of the joy is the knowledge that you can ride the horse and use the horse in order to serve the king. So you can actually do something that's reciprocal, do something back. And those, that, that's the third of these three joys that accompany the, 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 the maqam or the state of shukr. So we can use the horse to ride to the king's palace, to gain access to his presence. Similarly, everything in the world that inspires in us the sense of shukr is a means whereby we can return to the mun'im, to the source of that blessing. You can have a spiritual opening, a fatah, just by picking a plum from a plum tree. If you have a full, deep awareness in your heart of what is going on, the divine unrequited gift, that can open you up and you can be transformed and never be the same again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can put moments like that in your life. Or you can have, on a more down-to-earth level, an awareness in your mind, this is an extraordinary gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My intention in consuming this plum is to become stronger so that I can pray regularly and I can uphold the rights of my wife and my children. And if you make that your niya, even in doing basic physical bodily things like eating and drinking, then those things also become part of your suluk, part of your wayfaring. So this is... Uh, all part of the, uh, the wisdom that Imam al-Ghazali is uh, telling us about. Bayan al-sabab as-sarif lil-khalqi ani shukr If shukr is the obvious attitude of the sound human soul to Allah's gifts that are mabsulta, that are stretched out to us in creation, why is it that so many people are ungrateful? Wa qalilun min ibadi shakur he says, almost as a complaint, few of my servants are grateful. Why is that? Well, the Imam says this, I'lam annahu lam yaqsur bil khalqi an shukri ni'mati illa al-jahl wal ghafla. The reason why human beings fall short of being grateful for blessings is because of ignorance and heedlessness. Fa'innahum muni'u bil jahli wal ghaflati an ma'rifati al-ni'am. Because thanks to their ignorance and heedlessness, they have been prevented from knowing the nature of the blessings. And you can't imagine thanking, uh, giving thanks for a blessing unless you have properly understood that a blessing is indeed from a source. ظنوا أن الشكر عليها أن يقول بلسانه الحمد لله الشكر لله. And then because they think that when they have recognized the blessing, all they have to do is say الحمد لله الشكر لله. ولم يعرفوا أن معنى الشكر أن يستعمل النعمة في إتمام الحكمة التي أريدت بها وهي طاعة الله عز وجل. And they don't know that the real meaning of gratitude is that the blessing should be used 
in order to complete that wise purpose for which it was created, which was to bring about the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The real reason why we should be grateful for things is that each of those things offers us an opportunity to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beauty enables us to feel grateful to him and enables us to recognize the ugliness of vice and disorder. Therefore, it helps us to obey Allah. That the provisions, the food and the drink that he bestows upon us are also providing us with the strength with which we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the relationships which we enter into, us, into in this world are also contexts in which society can be ordered so as to create a space in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be properly worshipped. This is the highest view of shukr. It's not just looking at the world as though it's an art gallery and being impressed by the various amazing signs of the divine artistry. Often we do that, we can't fail to be impressed. But in fact, the reason why we should be thankful and the reason why we are required to be thankful is because all of those blessings are calling out to be used appropriately, to be understood in ways that enable us to reshape our lives, to bring us back to the state of al-qalb, al-salim. Imam al-Ghazali then ends with uh, a discussion of these two principles, sabr and shukr. And we very briefly looked at his understanding of each of those. And he asks the question, which is better? Should you be in the maqam of sabr or be in the maqam of shukr? Or when they succeed each other rapidly so that one hour you are sabr and the next hour you are shakir, is one of those times better than another for your heart? And he indicates that different scholars have taken different views on this. But essentially he's going to resolve this in something that inshallah we'll be discussing in a subsequent class, which is about the issue of faqr, or sacred poverty. The ghani, if he is in the state of shukr, the rich person, if he is in a state of gratitude, is in a high state. But the poor person, the faqir, if he is in a state of sabr, is also in a high state. So it really depends on your circumstances. And he's not going to take a definite view as to which is superior. It's always better to be sabr than to be shakir, or always better to be thankful than to be patient. Because, in fact, everything depends on the spiritual mizaj, the orientation, the composition of the individual, and also on the ahwal, the conditions of particular times and intentions and the, the particular spiritual perfume that exists in a particular gathering. In any case, we will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst the sabirin and to make us amongst the shakirin, to make us people who are not people of the surface but who understand every misfortune that come to them and so that we can turn it to good effect and who understand and give gratitude for all of the ni'mas, all of the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers upon us in this world so that we can look beyond those things to the source of those things and put those things to the purpose for which they were intended. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sami'ul alim wa tub alayna inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin salatan tunjina biha min jami' al-ahwali wal-afat wa taqdi lana biha jami' al-hajat wa tutahhiruna biha min jami' al-sayyat wa tarfa'una biha a'ala al-darajat wa tuballighuna biha aqsa al-ghayat min jami' al-khayrat fi al-hayati wa ba'd al-mamat وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين